as here. Hello there. I'm hoping everybody can hear me. We're just getting set up to do this first ever webinar. So um, maybe for those of you that are with us, if you want to type in who you are and where you're joining us from, that would be excellent. And maybe let us know if you are already part of our online community, the wonderful world of wax in Caustics 101. So we're getting a few people here. I'm just going to check down here. We've got um, Jacques. Um, I'm not sure where she's coming in from. Um, Kathleen is checking in from Clearwater, Florida. Awesome. Okay, Dana, great. Loud and clear in Ohio. Awesome. Great to have you with us here. Uh, someone. Um, oh, in the UK. They're having their warmest day of the year so far. Nice. I wish we could say the same, but um, we're actually freezing our asses off in Vancouver. Um, Linda is joining us from the West Coast over on Vancouver Island. Hi, Linda. Great to see you here. So we're just going to um, get started in, in a couple of minutes. As I say, we're going to give people a few more minutes to, to join on and we'll get started right away because we know um, people's time is very valuable. Yeah, we're getting lots more uh, people in here. Okay, we've got someone joining from southern New Jersey. Awesome. Welcome. Uh, that's Tara. Um, Judith from Eastport, Maine. Hi, Judith, and welcome. Oh, Tara, wherever she is, it's their wettest day there, so sorry, we we feel your pain. Carrie, great to see you, Carrie. I know what kind of weather system you're in, sorry. <laughs> uh, Washington State, Robin, great. We've got Dakota from Sacramento. Um, she's probably enjoying the sunshine. Uh, we've got someone from Santa Cruz, welcome. Hi, Suze. Someone from Seattle, Laura, hi, great to have you on this call. Linda, watching from Salt Spring Island, nice. I'm gonna be over there in the fall. I'm looking forward to that. It's gonna be great. So we've got another person uh, from Sacramento. So that's great. So I'm gonna um, get us started here uh, as quickly as possible. Um, uh, just a few more. Deborah um, from Lafayette, Colorado, hello. Um, someone from Brooklyn, great. Um, got, have lots of people and former students, lots of friends um, in your neck of the woods. Um, Sean Monet, great, she's found the link. I know I'm gonna be meeting you, Sean, at the end of the summer, that's awesome. Oh, thanks, Robin. Uh, lots of great messages here, so welcome everybody. Um, this is, as I mentioned, our, our first webinar, so we're also going to be interested in your feedback. Um, you know, after we get done, maybe leaving us some comments below, whether the information was useful, and also, you know, how, how are things streaming from where, from where you were at? Um, so that, that would really help us out because this is a nice way to be able to connect and deal with some of the questions that have been coming up through the program and just give us a chance to kind of, you know, connect in a slightly different way. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I think is really important, not just in our art making practice, but also in life is to continually push out so ourselves outside of the comfort zone. And for me, um, I'm very comfortable on the other side of the camera, which is, is surprising consider, considering a number of you know me through videos and now an online course, but this is something that definitely pushes me outside of my comfort zone. Um, but that's so important and that's how we continue to grow and learn and, and expand. So um, that's all part of it. So first of all, I want to say um, a big thank you to all of you who have been involved with our wonderful World of Wax and Caustics 101 program. I think that's been such an amazing 
thing to see how the group has come together in that private Facebook group. The level of engagement there is just fabulous. The amount that you're willing to share your ideas, your background, your insights has really been thrilling. And in that group, we have people from over 16 different countries, 37 different US states, seven Canadian provinces, and even a Canadian territory. So, I mean, the, the opportunity there to really have a lot of input from different perspectives um, is, is really what it's all about. And that is so exciting. So I've been just thrilled to see the level of engagement there. And it was on the basis of that and seeing all the questions and the engagement of the group that really inspired us to put together this webinar. So let's um, get started. We had um, put out you know, a, a prompt for anyone that had questions to put some up on, on that Facebook group. So we've got a few of them prepared now, which we're going to start going through, and then we'll be taking more of your questions live here today. So, okay, first question then, do I need to put medium over metal leafing to stop it from tarnishing down the line? Um, and, you know, acknowledging that they maybe didn't buy real gold leaf. Well, um, you do not and actually should not put encaustic medium over any leafing and there's a couple of reasons why first of all you wouldn't want to diminish the the sheen from any kind of metallics so anything whether it's you know um, metal foil whether it's leafing whether it's um, even metallic powders you want that to be your final layer and then just lightly fuse and even with your metal leafing if you've really burnished it in with a burnisher you don't even have to fuse that and by putting any kind of encaustic medium on the top you actually eradicate that great metallic which is why you know you probably used it in the first place so you you want to leave it just as is the other thing that you want to think about is when you put that leafing on there, you've now created a barrier between the wax below. So you've actually created a surface that the wax is not going to want to stick to. So it would actually ruin the structural integrity of your piece if you were to put any encaustic medium on top of that. You don't have to worry about it tarnishing. Um, I don't know many people who are using real leafing. Um, just because of the expense of it. Certainly the, there might be some people. Um, I've only used it once in my life actually and that was for an illuminated lettering for calligraphy where you've got it on paper and you know what was the amazing thing about that is even under very close inspection I couldn't tell the the real gold leaf from the imitation. The one benefit of course with your actual metal leafing is you can get about 50 different variants of gold whereas in your imitation gold leafing you've pretty much got the one but um, I know that's a bit of a long answer but no the, the, the short answer is don't put in caustic medium and you don't have to worry about it tarnishing over time so okay um, next question I was wondering are there any types of pens that write over in caustic I'm looking to enhance some small photos tried gel pens they didn't work um, I was able to use a small brush and some ink but would like to do some pen work in various colors. Any suggestions? Yes, okay, I have a, a number of suggestions. Um, first of all, let's just talk about keeping it in the, let's say you were wanting to do a very purist um, piece where you're using only encaustic medium and paint. Um, I'll just show you a tool here. There we go. Um, this is a, it's a wood burning tool um, that I actually got these, you know, they're actually a calligraphy nib. I hope you can see it there. So this one is a flat nib pen. Um, and this is just, it attaches into that wood burning tool. So what's really great about this is this tip heats up and then I can just put it into my encaustic wax, the a solid, so not the melted wax, but just a, a bar or a brick or, um, you know, your encaustic paint before it's been melted, just dip this in and it draws it up into that tip. And then you can write on top of wax and you can get these in pointed nibs. This is, as I mentioned, a broad nib pen. 
Um, you can also get, um, you know, the very fine kind of metal stylus, which is for um, a heated pen like this as well. One of the things that you might have to get, because I know a number of the wood burning tools don't have a temperature regulator as part of it, you might have to um, get a temperature regulator. And you can see here, this one was not cheap. It's about, you know, you're looking at about $50. But what this does is it allows you to plug in any tool or instrument that you don't know what temperature it's it's basically reading at and you have the control knob which you can adjust and so that'll keep your tools from overheating and overheating the wax so that would be a way that you can you know use wax and encaustic paint to work on your encaustic um, some other options though um, I don't know if you've ever used these. These are um, made by um, Stabilo and they're called Woodies. It's a highly pigmented, um, basically like a wax crayon and they come in all sorts of colors. Um, you can see here I'm just holding up a few. I've got red, turquoise, but I mean I'll just hold up like they come in uh, I think 18 different colors. They also have silver and gold as a as metallic. Um, and what's great is you can sharpen these down into a super fine point and they draw on your wax um, just like a beautiful crayon. And you can get super intense colors. You can color in fields. Um, you would want to fuse these lightly. And if you're just fusing it, um, you know, enough to get the glisten of the wax around, that'll be enough to make it permanent. One of the fun things to do though with these is imagine drawing either a design or let's say you're even doing a contour line drawing or something like that. Um, and I've got a nice black one here. So you could actually draw right on top of your wax and you could leave it like that and just lightly fuse it. Beautiful. You can water these down and fill in areas so you almost get like a watercolor wash type look. Um, but the other thing you can do is take your heat gun to it and, and really fuse it and what happens is the line starts breaking up and drifting all over and you can get some really cool effects just essentially from a, a screw up right like some people they'll they'll go to fuse these and it's like oh my god i think i've destroyed my piece but then they look at it and it's like oh <laughs> that actually looks really cool um so there's some different materials that you can draw right on the surface of the wax and these um they don't sell these actually in in um around where I live. So I had to order these online. I know you can get them in a number of US um, locations. So I've bought some um, at Artisan Craftsman in the States. I know Dick Blick carries them. Um, otherwise, you can just order them online through um, Amazon. And that's the Stabilo Woodies. So those are a few options, hopefully, to help you with doing some line work and drawing on your wax. OK. Um, our next question then, let's see, um, I'm having trouble getting a clean incised line without a wax ridge or separating the wax next to the incision. What am I doing wrong? What's the best technique? And then there's a second question. So we've lumped a couple of these together. When incising, sometimes my wax chips. Is this due to not fusing properly or maybe letting it cool long enough? Okay, um, so two different questions there. Well, I, I do a lot of incising work as part of my practice and I use a variety of different tools depending on the effect that I'm trying to achieve. One thing that you've got to consider is like, let's imagine that my hand is the surface of wax. If I'm drawing a line along like this, it's not like I'm pressing that down because there's no compression that's happening. So you're actually removing that wax. So I think the thing that you're talking about is what we would call a burr. You actually get a little ridge of the wax that's being scraped out of the line. So if you can see it here, um, a bit of the roughness along some areas of the line is actually what we would call the burr. And th these lines are actually pretty clean. Um, maybe yeah, more up around that top part um, you're seeing some of that, maybe what you're talking about. What I do is a couple of different things. Um, I use this tool and I'll just bring it into screen here. This 
this is one of my trusty tools. It's actually a clay tool. Um, this is called a loop tool and you can see it's got two ends, one that's got a curved end and one this flat end. The, this flat end is the one that I use a lot with my encaustic practice for many things. Um, one, I use this when I do incise some lines because as I mentioned, when you do that incise line, you get that raised bit of wax on the edges. And then I would use this flat loop tool to scrape off the excess. And then I'm not dealing with any little blobs or, or kind of that excess wax. Although sometimes I'll use a, a quite a um, large metal tool to carve into the wax because I'm looking for a lot of, I want it to have a lot of roughness around the edge. I want it to have a lot of texture. If I don't, I use this tool and after I do that incise line, I basically would, you know, kind of scrape this along the line to clean off any burrs that I get, any little, you know, globs of wax that I don't want to catch my oil rub that I'm doing to really make that incising stand up. The other thing you could do to um, help with that issue a bit is warm your tool. So if you heat up your metal stylus that you're using to incise lines or you heat up your tool, it does tend to more melt the area um, as opposed to gouge it away. And so you get a softer impression. So you can play with that. Um, incidentally, another thing that I use this tool for is when I finish my encaustic pieces, I always use this. And what I do is I scrape it along the side of my pieces to create a bevel edge on the surface because in shipping your works, whether you're, you know, a lot of the commission work that I do, those pieces get shipped in the mail because, you know, the people are not right here. And to protect the works, it's actually the edges that are the most susceptible to damage. So I like to create that bevel edge and which I use by scraping with this tool and then I burnish the edge with a gloved hand and that just creates a really nice soft rounded corner and I haven't had any problems with edges chipping or the wax chunking off or anything like that so I find this to be a really useful like an indispensable tool for me and these you can find in all of your um, art supply stores that sell any ceramic supplies they're often in the sculpture area um, so you know it's one of my most highly recommended tools actually is this loop tool with the, the flat end. Um, so that's just something I would pick up. Um, the other question was about the wax chipping. And I think that yes, that's likely you might not be fusing enough because if you're finding that some area of wax is chipping off the layer beneath it, that means that it wasn't fused well enough. So you might want to do just a little bit more fusing. And um, because I don't think that would be an issue of it, the wax being too warm, it's just more that you maybe haven't fused enough. And then of course, wait for your wax to be room temperature before you do any incising or, um, you know, even embossing into your wax. And we'll get into that in a little bit because I know someone had a question about that too. So there we go. Next question then. Um, can you put oil paint on top of wax? Basic lesson of encaustic paint, it's going to crack in a few months or years. Even if you heat it, it would be better to use cold encaustic paint. Okay, this is bringing up all sorts of good points to talk about. Um, so looking for my input on using oil paint on top of encaustics. Okay, so first of all, yes, you can totally use oil paint on top of your encaustic. Um, what you want to do though is you want to let that i i would use the word dry but dry is not actually technically correct because oil paint doesn't really dry oil paint goes through a chemical process where the particles in the paint realign themselves in a particular way let's call it curing for back, lack of a better word so you want to make sure that your oil paint that you're using, whether you've rubbed it into incised areas or maybe you're leaving some, some oil paint residue on the surface, you want to let that cure before, you know, you're putting on more wax or, you know, you're doing any other treatments. The, um, 
you can use it just straight out of the tube or you can mix it in with cold wax. Now the fact that in that question someone said cold and caustic medium, that is an incorrect term because encaustic implies, it actually means to burn or fuse in, and encaustic paint and the painting technique is when you're actually using heat as part of that process. That's an integral part to encaustic. The most important thing is that you're burning or fusing in each layer to the next. You do not want to heat up in um, cold wax. Cold wax is a completely different medium. It's a petroleum based um, product. It should not be heated. I'm sure there would be several um, you know, toxic ingredients in that that should not be heated at all. So cold wax is not encaustic at all. It's a totally different um, ball of wax. Sorry about the pun there. Um, but you can put cold wax on top of encaustic, but then you'd want to make sure that you are referencing that, that this is an encaustic mixed media piece or something like that. So yes, you can use oil paint on top of encaustic. Just make sure that you give it time to cure before you're doing other layering on top of it. It's not gonna crack or chip um, over time. And cold wax is not encaustic. The two are two completely different things. They can play nicely together, cold wax as a final layer. Um, we didn't get into that at all in this introductory program. Uh, but it might be something to look at further down the road. So, because I know there is a lot of interest in that as well. So hopefully that answers that question. Let's get on to our next question here. Um, I'd love to know how to do gold leaf and incised lines to get a smooth look. Okay. Um, yeah, me too, actually. <laughs> um, gold leafing is not something I would normally do inside an incised line and there would be reasons why I wouldn't do that because if you think of it gold leaf is gonna stick to any little bit of wax it gets in contact with which is is nice because it really wants to grab onto wax but the trick would be in a little incised area how do you get the gold down in there um, I don't think you could predictably do that in in a satisfactory manner now here's an example if i was wanting to do something like a very fine line i wouldn't think of using metal leaf this is an example of foil so i think if i was trying to get a very fine line i would use a, a foil on top of encaustic the other thing you can use are some of your powders this um piece here although it isn't in a um and in sized area, what I could do is I could carve down an area in my wax surface and then I would fuse it um, to create a very smooth finish in that area. And then I would likely do take my iridescent powders and rub them into the surface like I've done on the surface here. And so this was wax with a metallic powder and then I did some um, printing on top of the, the um, iridescent powders. So that's how that look was achieved. So I think if you're looking for a nice smooth finish, I would avoid the leafing in a small area and use some of your other products instead. Okay, uh, my question involves embedding objects into our pieces. Tips for working with delicate objects like flowers or butterflies, three-dimensional objects like beetles, pine cones, perishable objects like food, candy, heavy objects like metal. Oh, this is a woman after my own heart. Um, how do I have them blend into the piece without a large buildup of wax or damaging the object with heat application? Okay, great questions. I'm very glad you brought them up. We'll look at a few examples here. The first thing that I want to say, and this is the most, one of the most critical lessons to learn is wax is not a glue. I'm going to say that again for emphasis. Wax is not a glue. Um, that means that really anything heavier than a tea bag or a piece of tissue paper it's too heavy to reliably held down with wax. Now, I know this is shocking news for a lot of people, um, 
because they've either been told or they've seen things online where you know you can take pieces of paper and you can take all sorts of things and embed them into your wax um, I have not had success with that not even with you know fairly lightweight um, some lightweight papers um, and that's also I mean wax is not a glue that's you know it's a it's a paint medium um, so you really want to be you know thinking about what you're wanting to adhere to your pieces before you start working now that doesn't mean that we can't attach a lot of things into our encaustic pieces so you can see here in this piece we've got a butterfly which that actually was a real butterfly I've got three squashed can tabs a tea bag and part of a book spine and um, basically what I did here is all of those items were glued to my substrate which also had a piece of handmade paper glued to it so if you can see the rough areas around the edges of that piece there was a white piece of handmade paper glued onto a wooden substrate then I glued the other um, artifacts onto the surface the only thing that was embedded into the wax was the butterfly really and I actually even lightly tacked it down just to hold it into position because it was really delicate when putting my um, the melted wax over it um, so a good rule of thumb is to glue down everything to your substrate unless it's very very lightweight now what I did do on that piece and what I did do on this piece is I put encaustic medium over all of those things so in this one you can see I've got two different types of tea bags some matches and another can um, squash can and what I also found is I didn't particularly like the looks of my lovely rusted objects when I put um, encaustic medium over them it changed the the rust so that got me really thinking about okay how could I attach some rusted objects or different um, metal pieces where I really wanted to preserve that great grunginess of the rust and not have it changed by the encaustic medium I love the encaustic medium on the tea bags and a lot of other things and it's really exciting to play with that um, but I wanted to you know think of a way that I could attach you know other things have it structurally strong um, and so what would I do so I usually either I'm gluing things down to a substrate using either wood glue or metal glue um, depending on what it is uh, sometimes I'll even use white glue but I also use a lot of other techniques to attach things so we're going to look at another image here which um, I've attached a couple of keys and those are actually wired onto the surface so if you can see up around you know um, these areas of the keys there's a little loop of wire holding it there and there and on two areas in that upper key so what I do when I'm wiring something into the surface I completely finish the piece I, I've planned ahead of time where I'm going to position those so you can see even how I I did the rub um, the oil rub on this it's much cleaner around where those keys are it's lighter and it gets darker and more textural away from those so I knew where those keys were going to go and then I just marked them on the surface with a little pointed stylus where I was going to drill the holes and I used a super small drill bit drilled through the surface and then was able to slip the wire through there and then secure it to the back by twisting it so I'll wire in tons of things so I have different I use jewelers wire so I've got um, copper gold silver this was a wire that I picked up from Home Depot it was a dark it was a gardening wire the other thing is sometimes when I'm at antique stores or places I'll pick up just old wire that's rusted or corroded um, because you can use that to attach things in a way that you don't even notice it like when I have works or things objects attached to my works I don't want it to be like welcome to my adhesive right I don't want them to even know I just want them to be aware oh cool there's two keys um, as part of this now this series actually this was part of a, a series that I did called the detritus collection detritus is basically just um, a fancy word for garbage um, and it was a way for me to start using some of the stuff that I find on my walks and you know all the stuff that I pilfer and collect up and there were 14 works as part of that collection 
and the first piece had one object that was attached and it happened to be a big um, ball of rusted barbed wire and that was attached to the encaustic piece and then that key piece that you just saw was this, the second one. Um, the third one, and I thought we had included in here, but I don't think we did, uh, was three paint brushes. And those were hanging on the piece on little hooks. Um, this next piece was the fourth piece, and it was just, you know, little bits of wool and scraps that I would find, you know, laying around. And these... I glued to the substrate. So even things like wool and string, sometimes you can get away with embedding those um, into your wax if I'm using it as a line or something like that. But because I had a mass of these, I actually glued them down to the surface. Um, this next piece, um, I nailed things into the surface. So you can see this was um, different um, hair actually. Um, which was sandwiched and um, sandwiched between tissue that had been um, painted with encaustic medium. And then each of those little squares of these embedded hair samples was actually nailed in. And so you can see all the little nails um, attaching those to the surface because the paper was waxed. And so that would not embed well into the wax itself. It would resist it. So um, I had to nail those on. So I'm always looking for new innovative ways to attach things. And of course, what you wanna do is make sure whenever you're, let's say, screwing something into the surface or wiring it in, or in those cases where I was nailing things in, then I just use a, a silicone on the back and I would cover the ends of those sharp points so that you know a client or someone who's looking at my work is not gonna get impaled with um, you know how I'm securing things to the surface but so just I think general rule wax is not a glue that is so essential and then really be thinking about how can you attach these things in a really strong way so that your piece is going to stand the test of time right because I think structural integrity is is really essential Okay, um, next question. Would you please share tips on how to add pigment to the wax to make your own colors? Well, um, yes and no. <laughs> um, I'll share what I do. Uh, having said that, I don't um, get involved with really mixing pigments into my wax. I um, have worked with powdered pigments in the past for different art processes that I've done, more actually toning paper for silver point drawings. But, um, and I do have a number of pigments that I have, you know, imported from Italy, some beautiful, beautiful pigments. Um, but I haven't gotten involved with mixing those into wax. And I usually don't like to give people any tips that I haven't tried and tried and tried and tried and tried. Um, if you are wanting to do work with dried pigments, I would maybe Google that. Um, I know that you can also take oil paint and squeeze it out onto a paper towel, leach out most of the oil, and I understand you can mix that into your paints. Again, I haven't gotten involved with that more than a couple of times, so um, I don't want to advise you on how to do that. What I can tell you that I do, because I always think of my encaustic paints as I would any other paint, and by that I mean I don't like it when people can look at my pieces and know, oh, she used a cobalt blue. Oh, that's a nice cerulean green, um, you know, like that. So I always think that the color should be mixed in some way. So what you can do with your encaustic paints is you can just cut off little chunks of different colors and mix them together in your encaustic medium to make custom colors. And I think that's really exciting. I also almost never use an encaustic paint in full intensity. I usually am always mixing it with a lot of encaustic medium so that it, I'm using it like a glaze. The other thing that I do is I do a lot of my color work, I would say probably 90% of work that I do with coloring in my encaustic is using either pan pastel or oil paint. and. I do that because of the degree of control that I'm able to achieve and different effects. And that's just kind of what's worked for me. 
Um, I'm, it's not to say in the future I might not get involved, but um, probably at this point in time, I'd say I'm not your expert on that. Um, but we'll be looking a lot more at working with pan pastels and, and oil paints and moving forward as well and how you can achieve all sorts of different layered and luminous effects right through to um, real opaque and dramatic intense colors. So there we go. Um, let's see, how do you use a stamp to add texture, make de deep impressions in the wax without it sticking and pulling up some wax? Yeah, that's great. Um, I found some really interesting dried natural brushes at the river yesterday and thought it would make some wonderful marks on wax. Wondering how to get India ink on all this. Okay, so a couple of things there. Um, when you're working with impressing anything into wax, uh, one of the little tips that I keep in my mind is I'm either using a warm tool in cold wax or a cold tool into warm wax. Okay, so that's given me the greatest amount of success. So if you look at this piece and we just shot it at the angle here so you can see. So this is a, a number of letters and numbers and things of different sizes. These were metal um, stamps, punches. And um, usually what I'll do when I'm working in the wax and I have metal tools is I will have the wax cold, like room temperature, um, and then I warm up the tool. And I do that in either one of a couple of ways. If it's something that can stand, like even a metal cookie cutter or something like that, I actually just set it onto my grill and then I'll grab it and press it into the wax so that the tool is warm and it goes into and out of the wax really easily. Um, and so, like I've said, I do that with, um, metal cookie cutters. Those are awesome. Um, you can sometimes find beautiful sets of, um, metal cookie cutters that are great for encaustic in your gourmet food shops. So they have, um, I found a great set that all sits into one another and they're tiny like squares that are about like three quarters of an inch square up to about four by four inches. And those are great um, cookie cutters. I also have found those for ovals and circles. Um, and so they're just so easy to use because you just warm them up and press them into your cold wax and they just pop out beautifully and that's great. If I'm using a metal stylus tool or something with a long point or an end to it and I'm wanting to do something, then I'll heat it up using a, a heat gun. Um, so like I say, warm tool, cold wax or the opposite. So um, metal tools, I've had the greatest success with embossing into wax or pressing in. Um, not so much with wooden tools. Um, I've had some difficulties with those just in terms of getting a really nice emboss into the wax. So what I've done with those instead is sometimes I'll make the decision that this is not going to give me texture, but it might give me an interesting print. So I might ink up a surface like that. So with some of my nice um, wood, you know, there's some beautifully carved wood to, um, stamps that you can get that are, I think they're used mainly for batiking and um, the printing of fabric. But what you can do is you can ink those up and actually print those on a substrate so putting them either on a natural fiber or putting them printing them on a natural paper printing them on mat board something like that and you have a beautiful print that then you can put under your encaustic medium and then you can play it up by drawing in and emphasizing some lines that you maybe do with a, an oil rub on the surface um, i've done the same thing with some styrofoam and foam stamps they wouldn't give me anything incised or a texture, um, but you know I was able to get a print and then I could play it up that texture by doing some drawing on the final layer of wax just to get a little bit of visual echo and really creating some nice depth um, in the piece using those different techniques. Now the other thing that you were mentioning is you know using interesting natural bristles. Um, to get some really interesting marks and things. That's a whole other area that I love to do. Um, what I have is I kind of have, um, you know how we have our practice pot? And I hope you all have your practice pot established and you've been using that as a great cost-saving advice or cost-saving device. Um, the other thing is I have my 
substandard India ink collection. So what I have is I have my bottles of India ink that I'm using that's just fresh, pure, and maybe I'm using that with some of my brushes or different mark making tools, whether it's some of my automatic pens or whatever. Um, and it's pure and it's clean and it's great. Then I have another bottle of India ink that I can pour out in large dishes and I'm using it with some of those brushes where parts might fall out and kind of contaminate that ink. But at the end, I can, you know, reuse that. I pour it back into that bottle and I have them clearly marked. And that way I've got that kind of ink where I don't feel badly about, you know, using it again and it might have a few impurities in it or, you know, little blades of grass that came off or bits and pieces of feathers and things like that because, you know, our, our materials are expensive. We want to preserve as much of our hard-earned money as we can, but we want to have these tools that we feel like we can just use and play with and experiment. And so that's what I would do. So have your two different bottles of, of ink marked out that you can use for stuff like that. Um, and that's super fun. Um, okay, our next question, my heat gun doesn't have a high or a low. You can custom adjust the temperature in the fan. That's interesting. I would like to have a fan like that. A heat gun. My fusing is taking longer than your videos imply. Some of the delay in fusing is the draft. Okay, so I'm taking it you're working outside. Um, so wondering about, yeah, setting up barriers is good. Um, okay, so one of the things um, that you might want to think about is you know, in order for the wax, which needs to melt at about 200 degrees, your fan has to be considerably hotter than that. Now you're gonna to have to play with that because I don't know um, what the exact temperature would be. But I think a gentle fusing is not a bad idea. Like, I don't know if it's just that it's taking so long. Um, but one of the things that I did mention in the online video is we didn't show all the fusing that I did because literally that would have been I mean painful like I would have been having to you know tell stories or jokes or something you guys would have signed out I mean it does take time and I don't think enough people spend enough time fusing to be quite honest um, I think with your fusing a lot of people think that they should be fusing in one pass and they think okay I should just be coming in with my heat gun and I should um, just fuse this once and then I'm done um, and here's what I would suggest you do. If in raking light, so when you tilt your panel or your substrate or whatever you're working on to the light, if you can still tell the direction that you laid down your brush strokes, you are not done fusing. And most people don't take the time to fuse enough. So I find that with a lot of my layers of wax, I fuse it and then I've got to let it cool including the substrate cooling. And then I go back and I fuse it again and I fuse it again. And sometimes I'm fusing it four or five times until I can no longer tell, did I lay these strokes down in a vertical manner or in a horizontal manner? Like if I can't tell that I'm golden, then it's looking like a, a, a layer, a surface, rather than I'm seeing all those strokes coming across. And then I would turn my panel in the opposite direction and I would lay down more wax and then do it again and do it again and do it again. And you can play with that. I mean, obviously we're not talking about in a textured area. Textured areas are totally different. But even with that, if, you know, sometimes we wanna see our brushwork, but then it should be more like brushwork. It should be texture as opposed to, okay, I'm seeing a crisscross pattern of the strokes laid down. Um, that's a totally different thing. One I call craftsmanship and the other is texture and we've got to be really honest with ourselves which one we're which one we're dealing with so if it's taking you a lot of time enjoy that think of it almost like a meditation um i would just embrace that practice that you're doing maybe it means that your heat gun needs to be turned up a little bit if you're outside um fusing and you've got a bit of a bit of a draft or a breeze i wouldn't worry about any fumes if you are worried though you could always put on a little dusk mask or something like that but i think you should be you know fine as long as you know, you're not overheating things so you should be fine 
Okay, um, let's see. Use of handmade acrylic painted papers as collage element concerned about if the wax will separate from it later. And a related question, is there any way to use wax with acrylic paints? Great questions. And no, there is no way. You do not want those things to come in contact with one another. Wax plays nicely with so many different materials, whether it's we're talking about a lot of collage materials, printmaking, different papers, drawing media, photographs that are printed on particular papers that are absorbent and non-glossy and all sorts of different things. But one material that it does not like at all is acrylic paint. And what we've got to do is we've got to be thinking about why is that. If you think about it, in cost, or acrylic medium, an acrylic paint, is a synthetic product. It's the last paint, you know, in our painting history. Um, and it's it's basically made of, it's, it is a plastic. It's a non-porous plastic material. When you have something that's non-porous and plastic, there's nothing for that wax to hold onto. There's nothing for the wax to bond with. And if you put it on top of that, you might temporarily think that you've got a bond, but you don't. And over time, those things will separate, they'll fall apart, you won't have the structural integrity. Um, so unfortunately, you cannot put encaustic paint or encaustic medium over an acrylic surface, and it doesn't matter what that acrylic surface is. Um, but having said that, there's always a way around things. So let's say you created a beautiful encaustic or a beautiful acrylic painting or some really interesting acrylic sheets of decorative paper of your own design that you're wanting to incorporate. You could take photographs of those things and then have those photographs printed on a natural fiber paper and put that under your encaustic medium and work it up that way. You could do scans and print them using, you know, your dyes on a natural fiber paper and then you would be able to, to use them. You could, print it onto silk, right? And embed that into the wax and put it under your wax. So there's lots of ways that you can get your acrylic works to play nicely with encaustic, but while it's acrylic, don't go there. Because I think it's really important when we've got some damage control to do in the encaustic world, because we've had some people, unfortunately, not either just not knowing what they're doing um, you know, painting on gessoed surfaces that are, you know, meant for acrylic painting and not encaustic. Um, and, you know, some galleries have had some really bad experiences with some, you know, encaustic works that are falling apart. And so we've got to make sure as we're coming online and learning about this and learning to work with that material, that our pieces are not just going to look good till the end of the week we want them to stand the test of time. I mean, if you think about it, the original encaustic paintings that we have are over 3,500 years old and they're pristine and they're beautiful and they're this luscious encaustic paint on wood panel. How amazing is that? Can you imagine a piece of yours surviving for that long? What an honor, what a privilege. Um, and so it should be. So we want to, you know, just be attentive to that. So there's always a way, you just have to be thinking about what you're doing there. Um, okay, our next question. I have a sketchbook dilemma. Too many topics and too many sketchbooks. Oh, is there such a thing? There's no such thing as too many sketchbooks. Okay, I'm sure everyone has the same type of problem. Do you satisfy your sketchbook needs when you have, for example, three major paintings in a work, a show to design and hang, notes, okay, and entries for an online class? independent study with a fellow artist, travel to plan and document and stream of creative conscience. How do you handle all the sketchbook entries for every topic when the entries are in random order? Do you leave blank pages? Then you've got you're risking blank pages in one area and not enough pages for another one or multiple notebooks. What do you do and what is your advice? Okay, so I'll see if I can help you out here. Um, sketchbooks to me are an essential part of my own personal creative practice and certainly when I'm teaching people um, you'll notice that with our online program a sketchbook was a part of things you had handouts you were encouraged to take notes um, and I hope you're still doing that and still using your sketchbooks to do thumbnail sketches and planning and so forth 
and um, yeah it can sometimes become a little bit overwhelming so I'll share with you a little bit about what I do so I think in that video as well I um, you can see here's my sketchbook for memory and you can see okay my my sketchbooks tend to become a bit bohemic this is one okay so I my studio sketchbooks are hardcover black sketchbooks so this is like eight and a half by eleven um, or nine by twelve kind of thing they're all black hardcover sketchbooks and I write on the spine what's in them so in in some cases it's a medium so this is where I put all my notes and information about when anything to do with encaustic basically and I started this when I started learning encaustic because you know I was getting out um, different books and taking notes I was taking classes um, one of the things that I'll do just as I show you here um, you can see there's a great image that I stuck in from encaustic painter Tony Sherman and if you don't know Tony Sherman look him up he's amazing um, and then this was, um, you know, I brought Tony Sherman in to this, uh, the art school that I teach at. And um, he was with us for the day um, doing a master class with us. And then he had an evening lecture. And so all the notes that I took, I just put in that little envelope in there. Um, things that I was doing around media experimentation um, and so forth, I, I did there. You can see here's another sketchbook. This is Anatomy anatomy two so there's obviously an anatomy one sketchbook somewhere um, so I have sketchbooks where I'll put notes and information about a new process that I'm learning but most of my sketchbooks are more around a concept or an idea that I'm exploring and so I'll tend to put everything to do with that concept in that sketchbook so whether it's brainstorming notes um, all the research that I'm doing as I'm learning about my topic as I'm starting to do thumbnail sketches and planning out works or collecting materials sometimes I might be building things as part of it and so you're doing measurements and anything to do with a series I'll put in that sketchbook and I'll just pull it out as I'm working on that series with a medium sketchbook like the encaustic one if I pick up a new um, book on encaustic or something and I'm taking some notes I'll put it in that sketchbook so where it's purely about the material I'll go to that sketchbook now these sketchbooks tend to get loaded with stuff as you can see I mean if you look at the I mean that's you know this could be part of a weightlifting program literally <laughs> um, so if I'm going to an encaustic workshop um, if it's in Vancouver, maybe I'll lug this there, but probably not. If I'm flying there, definitely I would not. That's like my carry-on capacity right there. So I would, um, if I go to a workshop, um, I'll just take loose paper and I do my notes on loose paper. And then when I get back, I'll put them into that sketchbook. Um, I will also, uh, you'll notice there is some tabs. Um, so for different sections, if I'm taking notes out of a book or something, I might put in a post-it note there to mark my spot and then I just, you know, carry on. And sometimes I will leave some extra pages if I'm not finished the book before I want to put something else in there. But if I've just got everything within one book, I can usually find it easy, easy access. When I'm traveling, if I'm doing a travel sketchbook, like, um, for example, we're, we're, you know, just coming up on, on um, going away to Australia, um, of course, I'm going to be taking a sketchbook there because I'm going to be teaching some classes there, but also I'm going to be working on location. I mean, this is going to be a whole new landscape, a whole new place. And uh, so those, ten, those sketchbooks tend to be smaller, lighter weight. Um, sometimes they're coil bound or, you know, they've got a different size and weight to them. Often they'll be soft cover um, so that I can, you know, it's a lot lighter to pack around so based on what my sketchbook needs are I have different places of housing that material and I think it's important everyone devise their own system but I think that's how I tend to organize it for myself I think about learning about specific 
media and that goes in a designated sketchbook and then my series go in different places and then travel sketchbooks are a, a whole other kettle of fish so hopefully that um, answers some of your questions there um, sketchbooks are I mean are a, a fascinating area and I mean I always love you know when I meet other artists that's one of the things that I love to see are their their sketchbooks um, sketchbooks to me are really the the most intimate place of an artist because it's where you see everything taking place it's a, it's about process as opposed to the product which you know the product you see in galleries you see in museums you can go online and see that it's it's more rare if you really want to get to know an artist I think you have to see their sketchbooks because that's where you see their ruminations it's where you see their thought process it's where you see the things that intrigue them it's you know that's why the you know the, the it is such an intimate space um, and you know literally if if our house was on fire it would be you know the sketchbooks and the journals that are the real treasures because I mean the other thing is is that I'll often be collecting information on a concept for years before I ever work on that concept because I mean right now I'm engaged with you know memory and memory decay and and um, a couple of other ideas that I'm working with but I've got a sketchbook um, that's filled with research around the number four for example that I haven't even started to work with I think I started that sketchbook pr probably about 10 years ago and maybe even more but anytime I find an article, any interesting information about that number four, which is, you know, came up as kind of an intriguing number for me, um, I house it all there. So I'm building this database, right? Uh, my own personal record of how I'm thinking about things and things that come across my radar. Um, and, you know, sometimes I'll just pull one of my sketchbooks off the shelf and look at it. And it's like, um, it gets me so excited to work with that idea because it's like wow this is like cool stuff and you forget the things that you've amassed and it's exciting so anyways that's a very long-winded answer but I hope it helped um, okay can you use UPO paper with encaustic I want to do a couple of under paintings on UPO paper then enhance them with encaustic paint well, that's a shame <laughs> um, because you can't but um, also wondering when your next online class will be and oh, I didn't catch the end of that also wondering when your next online class will be and what it will be and if you have a cost yet for it okay so let's talk about you pull paper first um, you pull paper I don't know how many of you know you pull paper you put paper, a different way to watercolor, a different way to do all sorts of things. I think this was their old packaging. This is their new packaging, Yupo. There we go. Um, so it comes in small um, pieces, 9 by 12 uh, in pads, 11 by 14 also in pads, and large sheets. You can get Yupo paper. Um, Yupo paper, if you haven't worked with it, is a, a really awesome, fun um really interesting surface to work on it's like plastic it's like white um beautiful glossy i mean it's not going to look like anything in here but it's 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 like not drawing on paper it's like drawing on a white opaque beautiful plastic and you can use all sorts of different materials on it but for the same reason that we talked about acrylic paint um, encaustic cannot go on top of the UPO because there's nothing for it to attach to and while it might temporarily stay there it's going to chip off it's going to peel off it's going to do whatever having said that same thing as before you could create some incredible works on UPO and then photograph them and print them on a fiber-based paper which would then absorb um, the the encaustic medium or paint or whatever the other thing that you can do though is butt your encaustic um, right up next to the UPO. So if you see this um, piece here that's divided almost uh, in half, the top half is UPO paper um, working with India ink and the bottom half of this piece is encaustic. So you can do some really fun things by embedding or butting up next to one another um, UPO paper working with encaustic medium so very fun to do just taking a drink here 
so you know I encourage you um, you know I'm going to have much more um, work in the future with with UPO because it is a really exciting surface it does I mean it just shows you how you can be working with the same material whether it's graphite or India ink some of your simple most basic most affordable materials and just by changing the surface that you're working on you get a completely and radically different technique and you know something super fun to to play with so we'll definitely be doing more with UPO in the future so just know encaustic cannot go on top of it but if you've got it up butted up next to one another it works beautifully so what you would want to do is really adhere that down well to your surface using either you know your yes paste or your different you know gel mediums or whatever you're gluing your your you know paper surfaces down with so um, and you can refer to some of the videos in the online program about how to glue down either the photos or or papers to the surface to help you with that um, so oh and the second part of that question was um, do you know about any online future online programs and when um, and how much um, so yes there's definitely going to be more um, online programs coming this is you know such an amazing um, space and we're just starting to get the ball rolling um, I think one of the things that's really exciting if you if you think about that that handout that was part of the online program where you've got those four interlocking circles where you know you're thinking about things like technical skills so th those are all the techniques and you know we've started to scratch the surface of techniques there are literally hundreds of techniques that you can use with encaustic to get totally different techniques and those are really fun to explore and be exposed to and experiment with and then work with in your own ways so there's the whole you know the technical aspect then we've got really the the whole area around image development strategies and the elements and principles of design and you know some people said to me like how how could I have been working with art all my life and I've never heard of these things like wow this is just you know um, bringing up a whole new realm I hadn't even thought of and there's so many exciting things that we can look at there around those you know ways to create very powerful images course there's the whole um, composition and how we're thinking about our organization of space and how we can organize that but all of those areas I think of as as really being the building blocks to support the most important aspect of all which is like what is it that we want to say what is it that we want to share and if you think of it why why do we want to create something um, because we all have stories we have things that are important to us that we want to talk about that we want to share that we want to communicate with people and you know so that's um you know that's what we want to be thinking about and that's the that's the tougher part to get to that's how we create our original voice that's how we create if you want to call it your style or your signature mark and those those things take time to evolve and grow and that's through a lot of you know personal time that you have in your studio experimenting and playing um, it's great to do that as part of a supportive group um, so yes we have um, the the next actual online classes that we're going to have are um, a couple of sketchbook um, classes actually that really get into a number of aspects of those um, that I've just touched on as well as um, really looking at how do you develop an idea so how do you take something that's an inspiration something that's important or significant to you and how do you flesh it out and start creating visual works around that so I'm really excited about those um, and we also are already have our next um, encaustic program underway which will really build on the strong foundation we've started to create in this in the introductory um, encaustic 101 the wonderful world of wax so it'll just keep building on top of that and get more and more focused on on ideas and expressing those ideas looking at enhanced and more um, intermediate and advanced 
techniques and processes and so forth. So those three programs will all be coming up before the end of the year. So you can expect lots of exciting things in the fall. And then we're also thinking about, you know, we're always interested to hear from you as well as to how can we be addressing your needs um, and, and serving you in the most powerful way possible. And um, we know that we'd like to do some combined workshops that combine, you know, an aspect that's online, but also a portion that is live as well. So you have groups of people coming together to share in a live fashion as well. So we want to take some more questions um, that you've been typing in. So we're going to take a look here. Okay, you talked about painting cold wax and oil paint over an encaustic, but I've had some completely cured cold wax and oil panels and want to use those panels for encaustics. <coughs> um, yeah, I, again, if you've got... Um, if you think of it, I don't know, and you'd have to do some tests with this. The oil paint, once that's cured um, fully, and even your cold wax, I don't know that your encaustic medium would have anything to bond to there. Um, I think in that case, what I might try is I would take one of those panels if you have it um, hopefully it's smaller in size or maybe you can even if you have like a I don't know maybe a reject piece that you could cut up into smaller pieces and then I would note on the back the date I would work it up with some encaustic how you're thinking about doing it then I would freeze it for 24 hours then I would take it out of the freezer and beat it up like throw it on the floor whack it on the side of the counters you know, see what happens when when your piece goes through some temperature changes, when it's had some time. And then I would also observe it. Like that's why I would put the time on the back that, you know, I created the piece and then watch it over time to see what happens and um, just see whether it has the structural integrity um, to stay together. Because, you know, I think it's one thing if we're, producing a piece for ourselves or maybe even a, a family or friend where that might be a nice way to also get that ball rolling is create a piece for yourself and hang it on your wall and hang it under some different lighting or temperature conditions and run it through those kind of experiments that I just mentioned and then if it's hanging together a couple of years down the road then you might be fine right the most important thing is that um if you think of it, if you've got a surface that it's it's not going to absorb, the wax is not going to absorb into it. If you put, like this is your oil painted surface, if you brush your encaustic medium on top of that and you're fusing it, unless it can melt and bond in with that um, surface, then you haven't got a strong adhesion, right? One of the things that um, makes me always very happy is when I put on that first layer of encaustic medium on whatever surface, whether it's a wood panel or papers that I, I've adhered to a surface or mat board or whatever it is that I'm working on. And I fuse it and the first layer like just disappears. It absorbs in and even though you think it, oh, you know, it's like, yes, that's what needs to happen, right? It needs to have that, that surface that it's bonding with. So, um, I think if you've thought, got that going on, that's great. Okay, here's another question. I've read about using talc on stamps to keep them from sh sticking. Unsure how that works with wax. Hmm. Okay. Um, talc and powder. So like putting powder and then pressing them into the wax. I mean, it'd be worth trying. I mean, you know, I always think it's great to experiment. I mean, you know, the things that I'm talking about here and can recommend and advise to people, I've tried them, you know, countless times in my studio or I've done them and I've also seen the long-term results um, from it. So I would give it a try. Um, you know, if it's, if you get it working, that's great. I mean, I know I've had um, great success with using natural items or objects. So for example, um, sometimes I'll get a fresh leaf and um, not dried leaves, but fresh leaves or feathers or things like that. And um, what I'll do with that is, 
you know how we mentioned a warm tool in cold wax like not cold wax but room temperature wax so a hot item or warm into a cool surface of wax or the reverse so with a slightly warm layer of wax not molten but warm then I take a beautiful fresh leaf with quite a pronounced vein pattern and lay it on top of that warm wax then I put a piece of wax paper on top of that and I burnish it and you can either do it with a spoon or your hand or a brayer like a roller and then take off the wax paper and pull out the leaf immediately and you can get such minute detail like it's amazing like um, pressed into the wax and then let it get to you know cool to the touch and then you can do an oil rub on that and it's incredible like sometimes you'll think that those you know that the leaf is there that's how much of the vein pattern in detail you see and it's really incredible uh, I was just um, did a workshop and um, uh, one of the um, people was using ferns, um, both printing ferns and embedding the ferns under wax and um, you know to beautiful effects so yeah you can really have fun with that um, we're seeing a couple more questions here that have come in what causes cloudy areas in clear and caustic and how do you get rid of them okay um hi by the way um colleen um well there's a couple of things that can cause that cloudiness one is the the thickness of the wax so if you get a cup you know and it depends how thick the wax is applied sometimes if it's an early um, application of your brush it might be thicker in that area you know than when you drag your brush along um, so sometimes it could be the thickness of your wax that's built up um, so you might if you're wanting it clear in that area you might want to scrape it back the other thing is um, sometimes it can be the the type of wax that you're using so some of them are, have a little more um, it'll be yellowish than others um, but I don't think that's what you're talking about. I think you're talking about the opacity. Um, often, if I'm layering in wax, you know, you have that great when you're fusing it, everything goes translucent and clear, and it's like, ah, awesome. And then you stop fusing, and then it starts clouding up, and it's like, no. Um, but if you just let it sit um, and get back to room temperature, uh, and cool and sometimes that can be over a period of time um, that'll clear up the other thing that you can get is what they call bloom and that's where your wax will get a bit foggy in an area and you can just using either the palm of your hand you know like this part of your hand buffing it on the wax will bring that up or an old, old pair of nylons um, the other thing I'll do sometimes is depending if I've got a color under the wax and I'm getting some fogginess in my wax, I'll, that's sometimes where I'll rub in a pan pastel so that I can bring back that color if I get a bit of that um, opacity happening there. The other thing is just to be aware, I mean part of the reason that I started working with encaustic um, to begin with was um, because I started to explore this notion of memory and in in particular memory decay and so one of the things one of the qualities that I loved in in the wax was the ability to create that that obscurity it's not the wax was not completely transparent but it wasn't opaque it had this slight opacity and so I think for me that's one of the things that I love about the wax but uh, the other thing and i mean this may sound funny in that we're talking about an online you know encaustic class and all that i never call myself an encaustic artist um because i'm not i, I would never want to be bound to one medium because for me art making is very much about the idea it's about what we're trying to express and what you might find is there might be certain ideas that you think wow yeah this is encaustic is perfect for this and you know there's so many amazing things you can do with encaustic but it isn't the only medium um, and if you're wanting a glossy glassy like finish that's crystal clear 
it may be that encaustic is not the medium to use. You might be wanting to look at a resin pour or, you know, doing some sort of a lacquer finish or something like that. Um, so I say try to push the medium that you're working with, figure out all the things that it can do and all the ways that it can work for you. Also realizing though that, you know, there might be certain looks that you're trying to achieve that may be better met using a different medium. So just keep yourself open, open to that as well. Okay, another question here from Judith. I'm wondering about the tempera paint that you use to prime your panels. Is it archival? Is it very different from encaustic gesso? Okay. Um, I have only used encaustic gesso twice and I didn't like it. Um, and I'm not going to name the brand that I was using. And I don't know that it was a brand. Maybe it could have been old or I don't know how long it had been stored there, but I didn't like it. It, it, I didn't get the effects that I wanted and it, actually kind of um, kind of clumped up when I was working with it um, on top of it um, so maybe you've had better luck than I have which is is lucky for you what I like about the temper paint is it's it's um, super cheap and it's about the most basic simple ingredients you can it's basically calcium carbonate um, is the pigment and um, the binder is, a, a, I think, a light gum Arabic. It's almost more like a watercolor, but like very affordable. Um, so yeah, it's basically just a, a pigment that's um, the white pigment, which is a natural base pigment that's bonding with the, I, I most typically work on wood. Um, and so yes, it would be archival and I'm sure your encaustic gessos are. I mean, the people that are making encaustic gesso have done the research, they're gonna have a product that would be safe for encaustic, but um, I've just found that the encaustic gessos that I came across were, you know, I, there was a more affordable way that I thought I could get the same effect, so I tried that. Um, I hope that answered your question. Okay, here's another question. If I want to glue objects, things that I find washed up on the shore, a mixture of natural and industrial, would I have to glue them onto the substrate or can I glue them onto cooled medium? Okay, so we did, I don't know if you were with us from the start, we did um, look at ways to attach things. Um, so you might want to uh, review that, but basically there's no glue that I found that would adhere to wax um, that's not going to come off. So um, I would say I would always glue them to the substrate or wire them in or what you can do depending on what those things are. Um, one other type of, you know, uh, type or way that I've attached things to the surface is I have used screws. And so I would use a screw that's, you know, about the shortest screw I could find with the largest head. and after the encaustic piece is finished, I then screw from the top of the surface, I mark where the screws are gonna go, and I screw those screws in, and then I'm using an adhesive that's appropriate for what, I'm in, what it is that I'm gonna glue to the screw. So for example, there's different glues that I use if I'm attaching like metal bottle caps or something like that, and I'll use a two-part metal epoxy because I'm gluing metal to the metal screw. There's other glues that I use if I'm gluing something that's plastic or synthetic to a screw head. Sometimes if I'm attaching a fairly large object, it might have like four to six screw heads that it's being adhered to. And it looks like people will often think they'll see my works and they're like, for sure those are glued onto the surface, but they're actually not, right? Because I don't want to run the risk of something falling off you know like you do not want to be sending your works halfway across the country or you know i've got pieces that i just sent down to australia you don't want things falling apart oops hold on don't know what happened there there we go um so you know i just make sure that things are really uh, very firmly attached and when i try a new glue as well I'll glue things onto, say, the screw heads or all, you know, if I'm using any kind of adhesion, 
and then I treat them very rough. Like I want to treat them way rougher than any client or gallery owner is going to do. And then if things aren't falling off, then I think, okay, good. I've got a, a good adhesion. Um, often you'll find that where you're gluing things, if you've got a good glue, um, like a, a good glue based on what your item or object is, things will break in other areas before they'll break where you've actually the adhesion point and and then you know you've got a good combo and then you can feel confident about it so that that would be my advice there okay i've got a question from karen nancy many of your pieces have small raised areas of a different color of encaustic that looks like dots how do you get that and how can you use enamels with encaustic yeah. okay yes and that's just reminding me that we didn't put in that one image that we were going to um is yes I get those areas by um, it is wax those are colored wax areas and I basically paint those onto my surface using stencils um, in most cases that I've either cut myself sometimes it might be a pre-made stencil that I've used but a lot of times like I just finished two pieces this last week um, that have a, a raised you know a red circle on them and so what I did is I just used painters tape and put down a few layers of the painters tape on my self-healing mat used a circle template to draw out the circle the exact size that I wanted and then I cut that circle out of the the painters tape and then I took the whole painters tape you know stencil that I just made which was really fast and quick and easy put it down on the area of my panel where I wanted the dot and then I could just use a, a brush on my colored wax and use that to paint on the, the colored wax in those areas. The other thing too is that I'll often use drips or splatters. Um, you know, so it's funny, sometimes I'll just on my practice panel um, because you'd think it would be easy to get different um, splatters and different effects you actually have to practice those it's amazing and, and you can get all sorts of different splatter patterns depending on the angle that you're you know maybe hitting your brush on your hand or doing things like that whether you're splattering towards yourself or away from yourself whether you've got the brush actually even laying like horizontally or like this vertically like twisting on its side like this and then slapping it off what if you dip it in different things and drip from the surface like you can get all sorts of different drips and splatters uh, effects and I practice those on my practice pot and then you can kind of see um, you know on your panel what that's looking like and then that'll help you when you get to using your colored waxes as part of those and then I'll often get those to kind of stand out from the substrate by doing maybe an oil rub at the end so that you get um, a little haloing effect with a darker color whether it's an umber or a, a black or maybe an indigo blue or something like that to make those kind of drips and splatters and things stand out a little bit more from from the areas around it so hopefully that helps um, okay we've got another question here from Linda a while back you mentioned using fireproof board to work on you painted yours with microcrystalline wax. Did you cover both sides and did you fuse it? Okay, great. Yes, I do work on concrete board and I do that a lot because that way I find um, if I'm doing things with both a heat gun or I'm wanting to use a blowtorch or different things, I just find it's a great surface. Um, I only put microcrystalline wax on the top surface and yes, I fused it in. And it's amazing, like I painted it on um, and fused it in I think I put uh, just the one coat actually um, of the microcrystalline wax and it's I'm still working off that same surface and what I like is all it did is it, it doesn't totally seal the the concrete board but what's great is that when you get other drips and splatters of your wax it makes cleanup super easy because all you do is you know I just take a heat gun to it kind of warm the surface and then I use a metal trowel and just kind of well, where am I scrape it along the surface like this and all the little drips and splatters and stuff collect up in that I mean sometimes I'll put that in the garbage because it's got bits of um, you know pebbly stuff from the concrete board in it or whatever um, so I just do the one side just fuse it once and um, I've got a 
a big piece of microcrystalline wax so it'll probably last me until you know the end of my days for sure because um i may at the end of this summer resurface it again just you know because it'll make clean up even that much easier so um yeah just something to think about there so i hope um that i've answered a number of your questions and i hope you got a lot out of today's webinar it's it was um you know a neat experience for me to just kind of do this live kind of um connecting with you i'd love to hear about um you know how what was what were some of the useful bits out of this webinar for you if you want to leave a comment below on the youtube video that would be great um just before i go though i do want to um let's see present a little bit of a challenge here um we're coming into the summer months and a lot of us are going to be traveling different places or we're going to be spending more time outside in our environments hopefully the weather will be getting nicer in your neck of the woods um or you'll just spend some time outside and here's what i'd like uh everybody to try is um spend some time in your natural environment whether you're in the desert or on the beach or hiking in the woods or something and i would like you to see if by doing a few you know little thumbnail sketches and really thinking about the color palette where you are and noticing the textures um, that surround you what we could maybe all try to do is create a piece that's a tribute to a landscape that you experienced over the summer and just as a little tribute piece to it so we're, we'd be working abstractly so working with shapes of color and texture and think about how we can try to express something about how we feel about the landscape that we experienced sometime this summer and then post them up in the our private facebook group for the encaustic 101 wonderful world of wax and i look forward to seeing um you know some of your impressions of the landscapes of which you where either where you live or a special place that you experience this summer and I'll, I'll make this promise, I will do a piece as well to uh, commemorate some of the landscapes that I'm going to experience in Australia. I'm really, uh, really excited to be heading down there. Um, looking forward to meeting some of you who I know uh, live down under and are taking uh, you know, one of the encaustic workshops that's going to be happening down there. Really excited to keep this great thriving online community going. and. Um, until we meet again, either online or in a workshop, I wish you all the very best and happy creating. Have a great weekend, guys. Bye-bye.